Prophecy has always held a central place in the Bible. It's not just about predicting future events, but about providing God's people with guidance, warning, and assurance. Prophecies are a way for God to unveil His plan, reminding us that nothing takes Him by surprise. From the fall of Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, prophecy has played a key role in confirming God's sovereignty over time and history. It serves as a divine roadmap, helping believers navigate the complexities of life with the knowledge that God is in control. In today's world, where chaos seems to dominate the headlines, understanding these prophecies is more important than ever. But prophecy isn't just about the past, it points to the future, often in unsettling ways. As believers, we're called to recognize the signs of the times, and that begins with a deep understanding of the prophetic words spoken in the Bible. But what exactly are these signs? What events are foretold, and how can we know if we're living in the times that the prophets warned us about? Let's dive deeper into the prophecies concerning the end times, particularly those found in the books of Daniel and Revelation. The Bible is rich with prophecies about the end times, especially in the Old Testament book of Daniel and the New Testament book of Revelation. These texts provide vivid descriptions of global upheaval, war, famine, and the rise of a figure known as the Antichrist, who will deceive many with promises of peace. In Daniel, we see the prophecy of 70 weeks, which scholars interpret as a timeline leading up to the final judgment. Daniel 9 verse 27 speaks of a covenant made with many for one week, or seven years, which will be broken halfway through, signaling the beginning of great tribulation. Revelation takes these themes even further, offering a vision of seals, trumpets, and bowls of wrath being poured out on the earth as the culmination of God's judgment. It speaks of a one-world government, a single ruler with immense power, and a series of global catastrophes unlike anything the world has ever seen. These prophecies are not just random predictions, they are interconnected pieces of a divine puzzle. When viewed through the lens of current events, they begin to take on a new level of urgency. One of the central elements of these end-time prophecies is the rise of a global government, a system of centralized control that will dominate the world. This isn't a new concept for Christians familiar with the Bible. Revelation 13 speaks of a beast rising from the sea, symbolizing a powerful political leader who will gain authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. This leader, often identified as the Antichrist, will create a system where no one can buy or sell without his mark, forcing global compliance. At first glance, a global government might sound like a utopian dream, after all, wouldn't it eliminate wars, solve economic inequality, and streamline responses to global crises like climate change? But the Bible warns us that this kind of centralized control can quickly lead to oppression. The Antichrist will use this system to deceive the masses, appearing as a savior but ultimately leading them to destruction. Today, as we witness increasing calls for global unity and governance, through initiatives like the United Nations Pact for the Future, it's hard not to see echoes of these prophetic warnings. While the stated goals of such agreements may be noble, could they also be paving the way for a centralized global authority that the Bible has long foretold? The recent adoption of the Pact for the Future by the United Nations, with its focus on global peace, sustainability, and equality, is an event of great significance. Leaders from 193 nations came together to sign this agreement, outlining 56 actions that promise to reshape the future of our planet. At first glance, it seems like an answer to many of the world's most pressing problems, hunger, war, poverty, and climate change. But for Christians who are paying attention to biblical prophecy, it raises some unsettling questions. Could this be the beginning of the global alliance that Daniel and Revelation warned us about? 
The Bible speaks of a time when the nations will come together under a single leader, promising peace but delivering false security. This, pact for the future, could be the precursor to such an alliance, especially given its emphasis on global governance and justice. While it claims to leave no one behind, it also raises concerns about the loss of national sovereignty and the potential for unprecedented global control. Many are already asking, if this agreement is so good for humanity, why are some leaders, like Argentina's President Javier Milei, so strongly opposed? Milei's vocal resistance to this pact, alongside other nations like Russia and North Korea, suggests that not everyone is convinced of its benevolence. Could these objections be signs that there's more to this agreement than meets the eye? For believers, it's crucial to be aware of the spiritual and prophetic implications of these developments. Jesus himself urged us to watch for the signs of his return, warning that many will be deceived by false messiahs and promises of peace, Matthew 24 verses 4 to 5. This means that as we observe world events, we must do so with a discerning heart, grounded in the truth of Scripture. The rise of global agreements, the push for unity, and the centralization of power all point to the fulfillment of biblical prophecies. Now, more than ever, we need to be vigilant. The signs are all around us, and they're unfolding with increasing speed. Wars, rumors of wars, natural disasters, and global pandemics have made the world ripe for a leader who promises security and stability. But as the Bible warns, this peace will be short-lived, and it will come at a great cost. With a growing global governance structure and the potential for control over nations, we now turn our attention to the next critical question, how does this shift toward a one-world government fit into the larger narrative of biblical prophecy? Could we be seeing the early stages of the very system the Bible describes as setting the stage for the rise of the Antichrist? In the next section, we'll explore the role of global governance in the end times and its impact on believers today. As we delve deeper into the unfolding of end time prophecies, one of the most critical components to understand is the concept of global governance. The Bible, particularly in the books of Daniel and Revelation, speaks of a time when the world will unite under a single system of government, controlled by one central figure. This isn't just a symbolic narrative, it's a prophetic vision of the future that God has given us as a warning. Global governance in the Bible isn't portrayed as a benign or ideal system, it is a key marker of the coming tribulation. In Daniel 7 verse 23, the fourth beast represents a kingdom that will devour the entire earth, trampling and crushing it. This imagery points to a future global system so powerful and far-reaching that it will dominate every corner of the world. Revelation 13 expands on this, describing a beast rising out of the sea, with authority over all nations, tongues, and peoples. This isn't just about political power, it's about spiritual control as well. The Bible makes it clear that this global system will not simply be political in nature, but also deeply tied to a rebellion against God. As we move closer to the end times, the world is witnessing an increasing push toward the centralization of power. This isn't an accident, it's part of a larger prophetic plan. While the idea of global cooperation might seem like a solution to many of the world's problems, such as economic disparity, climate change, and war, we need to approach this development with caution. Global centralization often comes with the loss of individual freedoms, as decision-making shifts from the local and national level to a distant, centralized authority. As the Bible warns, in the wrong hands, such centralized power can easily become oppressive. When a single governing body has the authority to dictate policies that affect every nation, the potential for corruption and control increases exponentially. Historically, we've seen how centralizing power can lead to tyranny. From ancient empires to modern dictatorships, 
when too much control is given to one leader or one governing body, the results can be devastating. The Bible warns that in the end times, such a system will arise, promising peace but delivering oppression. It will pave the way for the rise of the Antichrist, who will use this centralization to establish his reign over the earth. When we look at the world today, it's impossible to ignore the growing movements toward global unity. The United Nations, the European Union, and even economic agreements like NAFTA and the World Trade Organization all represent steps toward a more unified global system. These organizations, while often presenting themselves as forces for good, are beginning to shape a world where borders blur, and nations are increasingly interdependent. The Pact for the Future signed by 193 nations at the United Nations is perhaps the most ambitious example of this global unity. Promising to address some of humanity's greatest challenges, hunger, poverty, climate change, and war, this pact sets forth 56 actions designed to unite the world in a common cause. While these goals seem noble, the potential for centralized control is clear. Could this be the beginning of the global system that the Bible warns us about? In Revelation, the unity of nations under one authority is not portrayed as a solution, but as a setup for the ultimate deception. The Antichrist will come as a man of peace, a man with solutions to the world's crises, but behind the facade of global cooperation and peace lies a darker agenda. This is why it's crucial for believers to recognize the difference between human promises and divine truth. One of the most seductive aspects of global governance is its promise of peace. In a world weary of war, inequality, and ecological disaster, the idea of a unified effort to solve these problems is incredibly appealing. But the Bible warns us to be discerning. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3, Paul writes, while people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. This scripture warns us that false promises of peace can lull the world into a sense of security, just before disaster strikes. The global system led by the Antichrist will promise peace, but in reality, it will bring destruction. The peace it offers is not the peace of Christ, it is a counterfeit peace, designed to deceive and control. The pact for the future is framed as a way to secure lasting global peace, but we must question whether such peace can truly be achieved through human efforts alone. The Bible makes it clear that true peace comes only from God, and any system that seeks to establish peace apart from Him will ultimately fail. The world may seek peace through governance, laws, and treaties, but without Christ at the center, it is doomed to crumble. As we move closer to the end times, the role of the Antichrist in global governance becomes more evident. According to Revelation 13 verse 7, the Antichrist will be given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. His rise to power will be swift and deceptive, and many will follow him, believing he offers the solutions the world needs. The Bible describes the Antichrist as a charismatic leader who will unite the nations under a single government. He will seem to have the answers to the world's problems, peace, economic stability, and justice. But behind this facade, he will be working to lead the world into rebellion against God. His rule will be marked by tyranny, as he demands worship and allegiance from all people. It is essential for Christians to be aware of these developments and to guard their hearts against deception. The Antichrist will use every tool at his disposal, politics, economics, and even religion, to gain control over the world. This is why we must stay rooted in the truth of Scripture, so that we are not led astray by the false promises of global governance. As the world moves toward a system of global governance, we must ask ourselves, what drives this shift? One of the most powerful tools in this process is fear. Fear of war, poverty, 
and climate catastrophe can lead people to accept extreme measures in the name of security. In the next section, we will explore how fear is used as a tool of control and why faith, not fear, must be the believer's response to these unsettling times. Fear is one of the most powerful forces driving human behavior. Throughout history, fear has shaped societies, influenced decisions, and even justified the most extreme measures. When people are afraid, whether of war, poverty, or disaster, they are willing to surrender freedoms they would otherwise defend, all in the name of safety. Governments and leaders have long understood this, using fear as a tool to centralize power, control populations, and manipulate outcomes. In our modern world, fear is pervasive. We see it in the headlines, climate change threatens the planet, wars rage across nations, economic instability looms, and the shadow of pandemics still hangs over us. These fears create an environment ripe for the rise of global solutions, where leaders promise security and stability in exchange for greater control. But as Christians, we must ask ourselves, is this how God wants us to respond? Should fear dictate our decisions, or is there a higher calling we must answer in times of uncertainty? The Bible repeatedly warns us against allowing fear to govern our lives. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, Paul reminds us, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This powerful truth speaks directly to our current age. Fear, when left unchecked, can cloud our judgment, distort our perspective, and lead us down dangerous paths. It can open the door to manipulation, where individuals or systems exploit our fears to gain control. Scripture reveals that in the last days, fear will be a primary tool of the enemy. In Revelation 13, we see a glimpse of how fear will be used to unify the world under a single, oppressive system. The Antichrist will use crises, whether natural, economic, or political, to present himself as the savior who can bring order out of chaos. Many will follow him, not out of love or devotion, but out of fear of what might happen if they don't. The Bible calls us to discernment. We are not to be swayed by the fearmongering of the world but are instead called to stand firm in our faith. The enemy may use fear to control others, but for the believer, fear has no place. Jesus reassures us in John 14 verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This peace, Christ's peace, is our defense against the fear that seeks to ensnare the world. In times of crisis, people instinctively seek leadership, protection, and solutions. Global crises, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, economic collapses, and the growing threat of climate change, create fertile ground for global unity. Leaders around the world, recognizing this, have seized these opportunities to push for more centralized control, often framed as necessary for the greater good. This is not to say that addressing these crises is inherently wrong. Many of these issues are real and need attention. But the way in which solutions are presented often involves the trade-off of personal freedom for collective security. As we saw with the Pact for the Future, global agreements often come with promises of peace and sustainability but carry with them the seeds of centralized control. The Bible warns us about such scenarios. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3, Paul says, while people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. This is a sobering reminder that the peace the world offers during times of crisis may not be as it seems. We must be cautious not to accept false peace at the expense of our faith and freedom. So, how do we as Christians respond in the face of such fear and uncertainty? The answer is found in our faith. 
While the world trembles at the thought of what may come next, we have an anchor that holds us steady, the promises of God. Hebrews 6 verse 19 tells us, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. This hope is not based on the changing tides of world events but on the unchanging character of God. Faith, in times of fear, does not mean ignoring reality. It means facing reality with the confidence that God is in control. The Bible is full of stories where God's people faced overwhelming odds, whether it was David against Goliath, the Israelites trapped at the Red Sea, or the early Christians facing persecution. In each of these situations, fear was a natural response. But faith transformed that fear into trust, and God showed himself faithful. In our modern context, faith looks like trusting God's plan even when the world seems to be spiraling out of control. It means believing that no matter what crisis arises, God's promises stand firm. As Psalm 46 verses 1 to 2 reminds us, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. In times of global fear, the role of the church becomes more crucial than ever. We are called to be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, Matthew 5 verse 14. As the world grapples with uncertainty, the church must stand as a beacon of hope, offering the message of Christ's peace and salvation to a world desperate for answers. But this is not just a passive calling. The church must actively engage with the world, not by succumbing to the fear and panic that surrounds us, but by proclaiming the gospel with boldness. When others are tempted to place their hope in governments or global agreements, we must point them to the only true source of hope, Jesus Christ. Furthermore, the church must offer practical support to those affected by fear. This means caring for the sick, feeding the hungry, and providing for the needy. In doing so, we become living examples of God's love in action, offering a tangible expression of faith in the midst of crisis. In a world gripped by fear, it can be easy to lose sight of the hope we have in Christ. But faith calls us to see beyond the present troubles to the eternal promises of God. Fear may be a tool the enemy uses to control the world, but it is no match for the hope we have in Christ. As we turn our attention to the next topic, we will explore how this hope, rooted in Christ's promises, sustains us in the midst of global crises and offers a glimpse of the peace that is to come. In a world seemingly overrun by chaos and crisis, the promises of Christ offer a lifeline to those who believe. Jesus himself assured us that we would face trials, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world, John 16 verse 33. This single verse speaks volumes to those navigating the storms of life. It acknowledges the reality of suffering but directs our focus toward a greater truth, that Jesus has already triumphed over the brokenness of this world. Throughout the Gospels, Christ repeatedly reminds us of His enduring presence, His unfailing love, and His ultimate plan for redemption. These promises are not theoretical or distant, they are personal, and they are meant to sustain us, especially when it feels like the world is falling apart. Jesus didn't promise to remove every hardship, but he did promise to walk through the fire with us, to be our strength when we are weak, and to provide peace in the midst of turmoil. These promises become our anchor, grounding us when everything around us feels unstable. They remind us that no matter how severe the crisis, Christ's victory is final and unshakable. But how do we practically hold on to this hope when the weight of the world feels so overwhelming? Let's explore how this hope shapes our response to the crises we face. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat the realities of life. It's filled with accounts of individuals who endured incredible hardship, yet through it all, their hope remained anchored in God. Consider Joseph, 
who was sold into slavery by his own brothers, or David, who spent years running for his life from King Saul. Even the early church faced brutal persecution under Roman rule. And yet, these believers didn't give up. Why? Because their hope wasn't based on their circumstances, but on the God who holds all circumstances in his hands. Romans 5 verses 3 to 5 teaches us this profound truth, we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. These verses remind us that hope isn't something that disappears when things get tough, it's something that grows in the fire of tribulation. Our trials are not wasted. God uses them to refine us, to build in us a hope that is steadfast and immovable. In the midst of global crises, whether it's a pandemic, war, economic collapse, or environmental disaster, Christians are called to endure with hope. Not a vague optimism, but a deep, unshakable trust in God's promises. Our hope is rooted in the reality that God is sovereign and that He is working all things together for the good of those who love Him, Romans 8 verse 28. This hope allows us to rise above fear, to look beyond the immediate crises, and to rest in the assurance of God's perfect plan. In a world that desperately seeks peace but can't seem to find it, Christ stands as the only true source of lasting peace. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid, John 14 verse 27. The peace that Jesus offers is not like the fleeting peace of treaties, governments, or worldly systems. It's a peace that transcends understanding, a peace that guards our hearts and minds even when everything around us is in turmoil, Philippians 4 verse 7. The world offers temporary solutions to crisis, whether through political agreements, economic reform, or social movements. While some of these efforts may bring temporary relief, they cannot provide the deep, abiding peace that only comes from Christ. The peace of Christ is not dependent on circumstances. It is rooted in His eternal victory over sin and death, which means that no matter what happens in the world, His peace remains constant. For believers, this peace is a vital part of our witness to the world. As others panic and fear in the face of global uncertainty, we are called to be a living testimony to the peace of Christ. Our calm, our trust, and our steadfastness point to a reality that goes beyond the material world, a reality where Jesus reigns, and His promises hold true. At the heart of our hope is the assurance that Christ is coming back. This is not just a theological idea, it is the bedrock of our faith. Jesus promised his disciples, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am, John 14 verse 3. This promise is our ultimate hope, that one day, Jesus will return to set all things right, to bring justice, and to establish his kingdom of peace and righteousness. In Revelation 21 verse 4, we are given a beautiful picture of what that day will look like. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is the future we long for, the end of all suffering, the final defeat of evil, and the restoration of creation to its intended glory. Knowing that Christ will return gives us the strength to endure the present crises. It reminds us that the story isn't over yet. The current suffering, while real, is temporary. There is a day coming when Christ will return, and on that day, every wrong will be made right. This assurance fuels our hope and gives us the courage to keep going, even when the world around us seems hopeless. As believers, we are called to live with an eternal perspective. This means viewing our current circumstances in light of the bigger picture, 
God's plan for redemption and the coming of His kingdom. Colossians 3 verse 2 instructs us to, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. This doesn't mean we ignore the realities of the world, but it does mean that we don't allow them to consume us. Our hope is not in this world but in the one to come. When we live with an eternal perspective, it changes how we respond to crises. Instead of being driven by fear or despair, we are motivated by hope and faith. We recognize that the trials we face now are light and momentary compared to the eternal glory that awaits us, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17. This perspective gives us the strength to persevere and the boldness to share the hope of Christ with others. One of the most frequently asked questions by Christians and non-Christians alike is, when will Christ return? While the Bible makes it clear that no one knows the exact day or hour, Matthew 24 verse 36, it also provides numerous signs that will precede his return. Jesus, in his discourse with the disciples on the Mount of Olives, outlined several key events that will signal the approaching end of the age. These signs include wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, and persecution of believers, Matthew 24 verses 6 to 14. As we look at the current state of the world, it's hard not to see many of these things happening around us. Beyond natural disasters and global turmoil, Jesus also warned that false prophets and messiahs would arise, deceiving many, Matthew 24 verse 24. The prevalence of deception is a crucial marker of the last days. In a world flooded with misinformation, half-truths, and spiritual confusion, it becomes increasingly important to be rooted in biblical truth. The rise of a global government, false peace agreements, and societal shifts further mirror the prophetic warnings found in Scripture, all of which point to the nearness of Christ's return. But these signs are not meant to paralyze us with fear. Instead, they are calls to be vigilant and prepared. As we observe these events unfolding, the urgency to live ready for Christ's return should grow stronger within us. So, how do we live in a way that reflects this anticipation of Christ's return? Scripture is clear, we are called to be watchful and alert, like servants waiting for their master to return from a journey. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 verse 42, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. This doesn't mean living in constant anxiety or fear, but rather in a state of faithful readiness, always looking toward eternity while fulfilling our calling in the present. Faithful anticipation means living with purpose. It's about aligning our daily actions with the eternal reality that Christ will return and establish His kingdom. This doesn't require grand gestures but rather a heart posture that seeks to glorify God in everything we do. Whether it's through our relationships, work, or personal devotion, every aspect of our lives should reflect our hope in Christ's return. Living in this way keeps us grounded, focused on what truly matters, and resistant to the distractions that the world throws our way. Being ready for Christ's return also means staying faithful to our mission as believers. Jesus gave us the Great Commission, commanding us to go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28 verse 19. As we wait for His return, we are called to be active participants in His mission, sharing the gospel, serving others, and living as examples of His love and grace. This anticipation fuels our evangelism, reminding us that the time is short and the harvest is plentiful. As we approach the return of Christ, spiritual discernment becomes an essential part of our preparation. With the rise of false teachings, distorted doctrines, and leaders who seek to manipulate the gospel for personal gain, it's more important than ever to know and understand the Word of God. In Matthew 7 verse 15, Jesus warns, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. The Bible gives us the tools we need to discern truth from deception. 
Through a deep, personal relationship with Christ and the study of Scripture, we are equipped to recognize falsehood when it arises. The Holy Spirit, whom Jesus promised to send as our guide, also plays a crucial role in helping us navigate these challenging times, John 16 verse 13. As the world becomes increasingly chaotic and confused, those who are anchored in Christ will stand firm, unshaken by the winds of deception. Discernment is not just about identifying falsehood, it's about choosing to walk in truth every day. It's about allowing the Word of God to shape our decisions, attitudes, and perspectives. In the last days, when confusion reigns, discernment will be a believer's greatest defense against being led astray. This is why staying rooted in Scripture and cultivating a prayerful life is so essential to our spiritual preparation. As the return of Christ draws nearer, we can expect opposition to our faith to grow. Jesus warned his followers that they would face persecution, betrayal, and hatred because of his name, Matthew 24 verses 9 to 10. Yet, he also promised that those who stand firm to the end will be saved, Matthew 24 verse 13. Endurance is a key theme throughout the New Testament, and it is a crucial part of preparing for Christ's return. Staying firm in the faith means cultivating resilience. This resilience comes not from our own strength, but from God's power working within us. Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 11 tells us to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. This armor, truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, the word of God, and prayer, is our defense against the challenges we will face in the last days. We stay firm by daily choosing to trust in God, regardless of our circumstances. This trust is not passive, it's an active, ongoing decision to rely on Him, even when the world seems to be crumbling around us. It's about remaining faithful in prayer, persistent in study, and steadfast in community with other believers. Together, as the body of Christ, we can encourage and strengthen one another to endure the trials ahead. Finally, as we prepare for the return of Christ, we are called to invite others into this journey. The urgency of the times compels us to share the hope we have in Christ. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 tells us that the Lord is patient, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. This patience gives us the opportunity to be His ambassadors, sharing the message of salvation with those who have yet to know Him. Our preparation for Christ's return isn't just about our own readiness, it's about helping others prepare as well. Whether it's through our words, actions, or prayers, we are called to be witnesses of the hope we have. The world is in desperate need of the peace and redemption that only Christ can offer, and we are the ones He has chosen to carry that message. This is where living with eternal perspective truly shines. When we realize that our time is limited and Christ's return is imminent, our priorities shift. We no longer live for ourselves but for God's kingdom. Every interaction becomes an opportunity to point someone toward Jesus. Every day becomes a chance to live out the gospel in a way that draws others to Him. As we anticipate Christ's return, we are called to a life of faithful readiness, staying vigilant, discerning, firm in our faith, and active in our mission. The signs of His coming are all around us, but we are not to be filled with fear. Instead, we look forward with hope, knowing that our Savior is coming soon to make all things right. Now is the time to prepare. Now is the time to live with purpose. Let us remain faithful, keep watch, and carry the message of Christ to a world in desperate need of His love and grace. For when He returns, may He find us ready, standing firm in the faith, and proclaiming His name until the very end.